Um, this conference will now be recorded. So I'll start again. So good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Singer. I'm a, uh, along with a number of the folks on the call tonight, a member of the Doctors for Change Queer Health Committee. Um, and the, the mission of our committee is, is in line with the greater mission of Doctors for Change, which is to be, um, uh, to be an advocacy and education and outreach organization uh, for, for issues that healthcare providers encounter in their day to day. Um, I use he, him pronouns and uh, I'm a, a resident physician at Texas Children's. Thank you, Tim. And my name is Lou Weaver. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I live in Houston, Texas. I am not a healthcare provider, nor do I want to be one. I just like to hang out with them. Um, I am a queer transgender man. I'm an advocate and a consultant. And with Tim, the co-leader for the Queer Health Group, um, we're brand new. We've been around since, I think, official since last June. And this is our first virtual coffee talk. So thank you all for joining us today. So the the spirit of this uh, this activity is that we wanted to uh, make it so that providers and all of us uh, who are on the on the part of the coffee talk and the idea that we we called it was a coffee talk because we had initially planned to do this literally coffee house style small group sitting around chatting together. But the spirit of this is that we want to create a safe space where we can ask questions about how can we be a better ally to our LGBTQIA plus patients. Um, and we, we know that uh, this is a, a process that we are all very keen to do well at, but at the same time it is, is one that can be tricky and difficult and new and there's a learning curve. So tonight's goal is to walk through some general questions about what does it mean to be an ally how can I be a better ally for my patients? And how can I be a better ally and advocate more broadly with regards to health issues? Um, and we, we do encourage participation. Um, and so there's a little chat box up top right uh, that uh, you can type things in if you have questions. No, and of course, back, uh, go ahead and please, please type away. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions or obviously uh, don't hesitate to interrupt us, please, okay? And again, if you're if you're not talking, can you go ahead and mute your phones, please, or mute your machine, your computers? Yeah. All okay. right. So <clears throat> let's get started. Um, um, I would like to echo what Tim's saying, uh, but changing this to a brave space instead of a safe space. So I want to, I invite you all to lean into the conversation to be brave about asking the questions. Um, there's not a whole lot of time when you might have the opportunity to ask questions of queer people um, that you wanna know in a, in a space where it is a safe space, uh, because I promise I won't laugh at you or judge you, but Tim and I are here to answer your questions as the most, uh, uh, to the best of our ability and point you to some resources as uh, we go and for some things that we hope to be able to accomplish in the future, hopefully with your help, so. All right, Jorge can, or Tim, who's in charge here? Who's running the train? Can we get the next slide? I think, uh, yes, so uh, Tim should have access to the presentation slide, so keyboard and mouse should be working. Okay, so uh, I do, and I, how do I, uh, I have remote control, how do I click forward here? Using your, your mouse, you could scroll through the yeah, there, yeah. I did it. I think he's it? a black person. I don't know that he has a mouse, but um, ah, yes. Whoops, you went back. No, I did. It. Okay. Okay. Great. You did it. I'm proud of you. Um, <laughs> so here is a little bit about DFC, the Doctors for Change, our work group. Um, and if you, uh, if anybody wants to get involved later, there's our email address and our um, the the Twitter handles for Doctors for Change, Tim and myself. And we're gonna start off with some a little bit of the alphabet soup. Um, and I say that in jest because while um, LGBTQIA, uh, it sounds like a lot, it is a lot, it's a mouthful. Um, sometimes I will say LGBTQIA, sometimes I just say queer because it's easier, but I also know queer can be a trigger word. So let's talk about what each one of these letters mean. Tim, I need the next one. 
Do any of you, before we get started, does anybody feel comfortable knowing what the alphabet is, um, that they, you are familiar with it? Nah, you all just gonna wait for us, that's fair. That's what we're here for. All right. So let's start with what is more familiar to us and then we'll go on to some of the less familiar. Um, hopefully all of you know what an ally is. We will also have a good definition of that later. Um, and that's why you're all here to join us to figure out ways to become an, a better ally. And so, it, and also hopefully a better advocate for your patients um, or even for yourself. Uh, coming out, we just generally talk about coming out as being somebody who comes out of the closet, um, you know, and that's when people tell somebody else about who they are. Um, and not everybody is required to tell anybody about their personal life, whether it's their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Safety can come into that as whether or not somebody feels safe enough to be sharing these, these personal details about themselves. But we do want to make sure that uh, healthcare providers create a safe space for the patients to tell them because it's so important. But that doesn't mean they're out in every aspect of their lives. Uh, gay, lesbian, and bisexual, we pretty much know who that are, the gay men. Some lesbians, uh, lesbians are typically uh, women, uh, identified people who have a sexual and romantic attraction to other women. Um, but some women also call themselves uh, gay women. Uh, bisexual, um, you know, when I grew up, bisexual, uh, we constantly made fun of them saying, you know, they they always, you know, they either they need to make a decision or they both have a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend at the same time. And, and that's, none of that's true. Bisexual people are uh, valid. Their identities are valid. Bi means two, uh, just like bicycle. And so they like two different orientations, maybe one like their selves and one other. And by orient, excuse me, two different gender identities, one like themselves and one other. Um, and we'll get into the, a little bit deeper into that on pansexual on the other side. A sexual orientation. And when we think about sexual orientations, most people will list the ones that are already above uh, this here. But we can't forget that being straight or heterosexual is also a sexual orientation. Um, literally everybody has a sexual orientation. A sexual orientation. Uh, am I echoing there for you folks? Yeah, that's my fault. I'm trying to take care of this. Sorry about the interruption. Okay, thanks, Jorge. Um, and transgender. And so transgender is the word we're currently using in our vocabulary today across the United States um, in 2020. And I say that because even in the amount of time that I've been out as a trans man for about the past 12 years, our vocabulary has changed. And we'll see that throughout this presentation. Uh, transgender is the word for somebody whose gender identity uh, is different from the sex they were assigned at birth. So, right, my brain tells me who I am, right, my gender identity, and whether I'm male, female, both, or neither. Um, and so, since my gender identity is different from the fact that my parents thought they brought home a little girl from the hospital, uh, that makes me transgender. Uh, my gender identity, like I just explained, um, everybody also has a, a sense of being, a, whether they are a man, a woman, both, or neither. Uh, some people just have to think about it a lot more than other people, uh, because it, for these sexual orientation, uh, gender identity topics, the default in our country is straight and cisgender. So cisgender means basically not transgender. And so we really need to talk about our language and what we're, we're saying when we're talking to folks. Um, intersex is one that providers um, are probably familiar with. A, we used to call people hermaphrodites. We don't anymore. We call people having an intersex condition or being intersex. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, intersex is about as common as somebody uh, uh, being a twin. Uh, so just think about how many twins you know. You probably know the same number of intersex folks. But it's none of our business to know that unless there are healthcare. We uh, unless they are our patients in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it can be something as, as uh, from one end of the spectrum of having um, different uh, gonads or different of the sexual development or having an XXX or an XXY. So there's no set way to be intersex. Same way there's no sex way to be, uh, same, same uh, no set way to be uh, have a sex orientation or be a transgender. 
So when we go over here to advocate, an advocate is somebody who actively gets out there and advocates for or stands up for, speaks out for somebody who is not a member of the same group uh, as they are themselves in. Uh, coming in, we are inviting you to come into this conversation, lean into it, be here with me. Uh, asexual, asexual means for those who do not experience asexual uh, attraction to other folks. They might have a romantic attraction. They want to uh, cuddle. They want to, they feel strongly, have an emotional bond to other folks, but maybe not not, not really interested in sex. Uh, pansexual. So for some people, they say that pan is like bi on steroids, right? Because bi means two, pan um, means all or many. And so pansexual basically means I'm attracted to a lot of different people. And it's more about the person rather than how they identify or what body parts they have. Uh, for queer, so queer when I was growing up, um, showing my age a little bit here, um, was a very bad word. It was a slur. It was something that was used to make fun of and hurt LGBTQ folks. And we didn't even have an LGBTQ community when I was growing up. We barely talked about gays and lesbians. But queer was definitely a bad word. But like so many words, uh, it, it comes back and the community takes it, it over again. It re the community has reclaimed queer. Uh, queer really just means anything outside of the box. And so a lot of people can use queer for a lot of different reasons. Uh, for instance, I use queer both for my gender identity and for my sexual orientation, um, meaning that it's it just doesn't line up. I was a female identified person. I was out as a lesbian until I was 37. Then I found the words, the vocabulary in the community uh, and realized I was uh, that the words that everything that I've been feeling and experiencing was meant that I was a transgender man and I started to transition in many different ways. Um, so I, I feel like my gender identity is queer because it's not that that's norm of, of what uh, people identify I, I go through in our society. Um, non-binary right the binary meaning one or the other uh, so somebody who has a non-binary gender identity would not identify with a man or a woman they might identify somewhere in the middle here um, or outside of, of a outside of the binary i kind of think i don't think it's a straight line i really think it's like a galaxy and so um, non-binary just fits somewhere other than these two boxes um, these uh, acronyms here of the QPOC, TPOC, and trans women of color, or uh, is uh, so queer people of color, trans people of color, trans women of color. These are all very important in our communities. And if, if you'll actually notice down in the right hand side of, of the logo that Jorge created for us, it has the black and brown stripes at the top uh, because even in the LGBTQ community, racism uh, does exist even within a marginalized community. And so highlighting the differences uh, that these marginalized communities face and the intersections where they're facing more, they have multiple marginalized identities. Um, why the plus? So when we say, L um, as you can see, there's LGBTQIA plus, but we also have the pan, queer, non-binary. Where do they all fit? Um, really, the, the, the letters, each letter is important to the individual. Each identity is important. And so instead of constantly having to add more, I think that's why we've added the plus. We're going to LGBTQIA is what came, what we, I think, as a community large, we didn't sit down and have a discussion about it, but we just kind of settled on the LGBTQIA and knowing that there's other identities out there as well. So the I stands for intersex, the A stands for asexual, and added the plus to acknowledge the fact that there are so many different identities within us. Um, and then SOGI just stands for sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, and so we're talking mainly today about marginalized uh, SOGI identities, as the case may be. And so we also talk about SOGI information on an intake form. Uh, so, you know, Tim asked a question about coming in as it relates to self-realization. And, and, you know, some people would say coming in, they coming into their own of realizing who they are and how this all fits because from the time that we're very young in our country here in the United States, um, just assuming that that's where we all live right now, uh, not that that's where we grew up, but e even so everything that we see tells us that we need to grow up and be a straight, 
cisgender person. And it's not necessarily that it, it says that so much, but it's like, think about all of the magazine articles we read or all of the TV shows. And so coming into our own is like saying like, it's, it's, it's a lot of work because we have to deal with so many other things of that we are being told really from the time that we're two or three, uh, you know, when we're watching TV or when our parents are reading us books, think about everything that it's a very six, uh, cisgender heterosexist society that we live in of thinking that that's all there is. Um, I hope that's good for you, Tim. Um, and of, of course there folks, if you need anything else, I think you can click on the glossary there. We did get these off the internet and then um, wanted to highlight some of the ones we're gonna be talking about and some of the ones you might be hearing. And again, some of these ones that are on the less familiar, if you haven't heard them now, you will hear them very much in the, in the future. All right, we got one more vocabulary that I get to talk to you about. I don't have control, so if, Tim, can you help me out? All right, so here's some more that are a little bit more on the healthcare side that you will be, need to be aware of as a provider. And, and as a provider, whether you are mental health, um, a traditional medical doctor, acupuncture, it doesn't matter. All of these things come into play. So the ones that we, um, at least the community, is more familiar with or otherwise, assigned female and assigned male at birth, um, it really simply means that the doctor checked the baby that was born, saw a penis or did not see a penis, and therefore assigned a baby a sex. Um, and so, as we know, babies with uh, exterior genitalia that are penises gets assigned male, and those that have something different are assigned female. Um, and then if they have the DSD, there was a difference in sex. <laughs> it's a difference in sex. I usually say characteristics, but that's uh, development. Thank you. Um, is how uh, when babies in utero, if they're watching wet weather through, uh, an ultrasound can see things going on um, mostly throughout, at birth. They can see that maybe a, a baby, a newborn has a penis and a, a vaginal opening, a vulva. And, and so then that's when somebody might know at birth that um, babies are, have an intersex condition. Um, or if they, are doing, if they ha have a suspect, they can check and see whether or not there's um, interior reproductive organs while there's a, a penis, a phallus. So there's a lot of different ways that um, intersex folks show up. Uh, MSM and WSW. MSM is much more common than WSW. Uh, it stands for men who have sex with men um, or women who have sex with women. Um, these are folks who do not self-identify as being gay or lesbian. They are having sex with their friends or sex with a group of people for multiple reasons. Some of them are societal, some of them are cultural. They might be on the down low um, and in do not want to claim the identity um, for any reason as being gay and or bisexual. Uh, so, and then PrEP, oh, Tim, that should, sorry, that should have been a small R, I didn't catch that earlier. So it stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, and it's a, it's a drug that somebody can take once a day that is 97% uh, effective in the use of um, stopping HIV. So you're preventing HIV from happening. Um, people uh, who take PrEP, and anybody can take PrEP, a provider needs to to prescribe that and you get uh, your daily pill, you have to get your blood drawn and things like that. Uh, but it is really important, it has really changed uh, things for mostly gay and bisexual men or men who have sex with men. Uh, but it also needs to be, we need to be having more people on PrEP. We need more people to have access to PrEP. And, and uh, Gilead, the maker of the number one pill is Truvada, and they have been able to make that much more affordable for folks and, um, and be able to have access to it much quicker. Uh, hormone therapy is for trans folks who, uh, and non-binary folks who want to have some sort of a physical medical transition. Um, so hormone therapy, uh, for example, for trans men, generally consists of a testosterone shot. Uh, it could be a gel or a patch as well. Uh, and that's, uh, depending on what type of, of hormone therapy you're taking, it's, it will be lifelong. And you do that with a, your consent of your doctor. Uh, basically, I describe this as um, 
a second puberty. Um, if you've gone through one puberty as a cisgender child and um, when you're through your teens or whatever um and then i went through a second puberty at the age of 38 when i started my hormones so um the typical things that you would associate with a masculinizing or a feminizing hormone or uh, excuse me a, a um, puberty would happen to somebody who's did, taking their hormones uh transgender women most often take estrogen which can be a pill um, or a shot, and some of them will also take an androgen blocker. So basically that just blocks the testosterone that's um, in their body. Um, pronouns, pronouns are incredibly important. We can see that this is, can be something that uh, people take for granted, but I hope you notice that Tim and I both introduced ourselves with our pronouns. And when we started, hormones are, or pronouns, excuse me, are so important to trans and non-binary folks because that means that we're being seen. Um, I know for a fact that Tim has his pronoun button on his um, when he gets dressed and he goes to work that says he and that also that little button right there can be a, a signal to people that like hey you get it and you're a safe person uh, and so we modeled good behavior in the beginning saying hi my name is Lou my pronouns are not he him or, or they, they are he him or his um, also a very important I use my pronouns I don't prefer my pronouns I think that's later in here that's the way we used to talk and not how we talk anymore um, all right uh, I want to speed up a little bit here uh, binder or binding so trans men who have not had top surgery top surgery in my world is a basically a double mastectomy in your world uh, making sure that my chest looks more masculized um, so it's flat um, but before I had top surgery I did something called binding which meant I wore a double layer thick uh, vinyl binder that like literally made me appear to have a flatter chest. Um, it is a very thick binder. I mean, it's so thick, literally you pull on it and it will snap back. Uh, it, it can be damaging to folks who have to wear it for a long time, uh, can't take a deep breath, um, what's going on with the tissue underneath it, et cetera. Uh, top surgery is and can be life-saving. It is an essential surgery for trans men um, and also trans women because they consider uh, breast augmentation to be top surgery as well. Um, now, hormone therapy can produce uh, breasts for trans women, but if, if it's not, it, they might still want trans uh, top surgery, excuse me. Uh, bottom surgery is anything that uh, below the belt, basically. I also consider my hysterectomy to be a bottom surgery. Um, there are multiple differences uh, for both trans men and trans women to have bottom surgeries. And those, um, they can be from a, a simple stage of my hysterectomy on up to having a phallus added for a trans man, testicles added, uh, or for a transgender woman having a neo-vagina created. I want to, when we talk about surgeries, we can't forget that transgender women have what in our community is typically called facial feminization surgery, and in other other communities is just uh, facial plastic surgeries. So whether it's a nose, a jawline, eyebrows, anything like that, uh, that somebody might want. And again, these are essential surgeries. These are not cosmetic. So uh, I often get asked, have you had the surgery? Well, I mean, there's multiple different surgeries that somebody could have, but I really know what they're asking. And I usually tell them it's none of their business. Now, if you're my provider, that it might be different. But also, like, do you need to know these things? Uh, so PEP is uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. It's, uh, it's basically if somebody thinks they've been exposed to HIV while not being on PrEP, for example, if a condom broke or if they forgot to use a condom or whatever, uh, they can take PEP. It's a regimen of a couple of days for, I think, up to 72 hours after the sexual contact that can lessen the risk of the HIV, the virus actually taking hold in their body. Um, treatment as prevention. So uh, the, for people who cannot remember to take their PrEP every day, um, and so they might have treatment as prevention that they you know, they get treated afterwards and that's how they prevent the virus. So PEP could be one example of having treatment as prevention and other things. So when you're talking to people who are having sex with men or coming into uh, what we might consider to be risky behavior or at a higher risk for HIV, uh, we really need to talk about PrEP, PEP and treatment as prevention, which one somebody's using. Um, Hormone blockers. Hormone blockers are generally for those that are 
uh, about to hit Tanner stage two, which is about to go into puberty, so somewhere between the ages of nine and 12. And basically they just stop the hormones that are about to go cruising through a child's body, a youth's body, um, from, from happening, the, the, from binding to anything. Uh, they are very important. They can be life-saving for a youth. They are done with the permission of a parent, with the child, and, and generally with a medical doctor. Um, sometimes a child also has a, a therapist as well, but uh, it, um, the therapist can help navigate all of these other things. I want to highlight the fact that with, no transgender person absolutely has to have a therapist. Like I'm an almost 50 year old guy growing up in the United States. I have other issues that need my therapist. Uh, but the therapy does help with when the societies are telling us many different things and helping a child learn how to navigate whatever's going on for them and the family as well. Um, and then tucking. Tucking is really important for some transgender women. It's the act of uh, hiding their phallus. Um, they sometimes tuck the testicles up inside of, of the cavity in their body and then take the, the, the phallus and, and pull it and, and uh, tuck it back between their legs. Um, maybe use super tight um, underwear or a gaff like a ballet person might use. Um, and so that creates the illusion of a flat front. Um, and these are, it's also very important for some trans women to do this because if people are seeing lumps and bumps where they should or shouldn't be on trans people, should or shouldn't by societal standards, right? That's what puts them in danger. Um, so it could be a square jawline, the five o'clock shadow. It could be lumps across the chest for a transgender man um, or what somebody perceives is or is not there in somebody's um, between somebody's legs. And so tucking uh, does happen. So if you have a transgender woman who is a patient of yours, uh, talk to them about how long they're tucking, about what they're doing, if they're making sure they're safe, because those that can be um, that can also create complications for them in the future. And then. OK, so before we move on, does anybody have any further terms that they want to bring up, ask about? Okay, thank you for that, Lou. And we have the running yeah. chat going along the side if, uh, if folks have stuff <laughs> that they want to add there too. Cool. Okay. So. Okay, so I'll go through a couple of the next slides rather rather quickly, but uh, to to give a sense of it, there's almost a million LGBTQIA plus adults in in Texas. Um, which means that over 4% of Texans I identify um, as something other than non-cis male, non-cis hetero. Um, and similarly, uh, there are uh, an estimated over 160,000 children. Um, these statistics come from uh, the Williams Institute at UCLA, which has some fabulous resources and great studies out there uh, on demographics, as well as um, a lot of resources for healthcare providers um, and, and policy advocates, um, both, uh, both within and outside of the healthcare space uh, specifically. Um, and throughout the presentation, there are, there are various links um, that, that folks can uh, access. These slides will also be up on uh, the doctorsforchange.org website uh, for folks to download and, and, and click through the resources. Um, see here. There we go. Okay. Yep. It's not like super smooth. It's not bad, but it's not seamless. All right. It's our first. We'll get better. We're, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. All right. Well, here's the, here's the takeaway. Um, the prior two slides what they'd asked are the following. First off, they'd showed, uh, I guess there's a lag here. Hey, Jorge, can I ask you to just control the slides, please? If that seems yeah, to be faster. And I don't, right. yeah. 
Okay. So which you slide can go to the graph right? slide, please. Yeah. This one here? Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Yeah. Right. So this slide uh, is also from the Williams Institute, and it points out some of the demographics in Texas. And this is what I wanted to uh, point out, that you can go state by state and get a sense of this uh, information uh, from UCLA, both by demographic, by age. And you'll note that the graph at the right does not include statistics for children. Um, this also includes uh, LGBTQIA folks who are uh, raising children, um, male, female estimates. Um, so there's a lot of demographic information that's out there for that we should consider as healthcare providers. But let's go to the next slide, please. So question to the group. And we can offer a definition on the following slide, but what is allyship? What does allyship mean for healthcare providers? And we can we can sit on the definition uh, in the next slide, please, Jorge. I think, uh, so the definition here that, and we like this definition, um, and it, it came from the, uh, uh, the Fenway Health Resources that we're reading about, is a person who actively supports the rights of a marginalized community, even though that, per that person is not a member of that community. Um, and I think that each of us has some group of folks to whom we feel in allyship responsibility for. And um, and obviously tonight's talk is specific to one community, uh, but I think that we all have other communities uh, for which that's that's a feeling that we have as well. Um, if anybody wants to give an example of that, or if anybody just wants to think about how your own allyship is manifest, and what are the gestures that you take, because one of the takeaways from tonight's talk that we want to get at is that allyship can be done in ways small, medium, and large. Okay. And I think one thing that we don't think about when we think about marginalized communities and things like that is that queer folks are in every other community. We are the only marginalized community when you think about LGBTQIA plus people, we are in every other community, whether it's a black or brown community, whether Jewish or Muslim or refugee, um, or those that are born here, born in Canada, pick a space, right? And so that is something I think that is a unique to this community. So no matter who you're serving, who your patients are, who you're seeing, chances are you are gonna see an LGBTQIA person. Um, hopefully you know it, um, or you're asking about it, but it, uh, that's also something to think about, that you are always interacting with this group. Okay, anybody else have any thoughts that they wanna share about that? Okay, so let's um, go to the next slide, William. please. Yeah, William, please. Um, I was just going to say, um, I know one thing that I had to um, um, sit with, and I, I think um, at the time I was at UT, we had a whole class dedicated to it. Um, but one particular class we focused on, uh, I guess, allyship to women and recognizing that just because I may not be an an active perpetrator towards women that there's some you know little things that i might be doing to um reduce like a woman's voice in you know conversation whether that be mansplaining or um, um undercutting things or disagreeing with things in a certain context and so that's something that i'm continuously mindful of is about um making sure that i am um, creating space um, for especially since my field is predominantly dominated by women that I am creating space for um, all people to be heard but particularly the voices of women um, especially when they have a leadership role and not trying to um, create disruptions and allow uh, side jokes to continue and other things like that exactly William thank you for sharing that I think that's so important that sometimes whether, like you say, whether it's mansplaining or sometimes I get cisplained a lot of things. Oh, like, no, trans people need this. I'm like, no, that's not really real, right? Um, but thank you for sharing your experience with us. You're welcome. 
I think it's I think that's something that healthcare providers in particular, because healthcare providers have a responsibility to be educators to patients, is especially tricky in that we're trying to convey information to patients, but we're also trying to convey it in a way that's going to help it be heard as well as possible. Um, and the 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 direct and indirect signals that we send in the ways that we do that um, can really make people feel like they've been heard and spoken with rather than not heard and spoken to. Um, but it's challenging. It's very, very challenging. So how, when a healthcare provider trips over their own feet or does something that they shouldn't be doing, um, can they correct themselves in that regard as an active allyship? I personally believe in humility, humility. Like if I don't know something or I'm not um, as familiar with someone's experience that um, I allow that to happen. I know when, so by training, I'm a social worker. Um, and at the time when I was working at a drop-in center, we had a lot of trans women um, come in for services um, who were experiencing homelessness. Um, and you know, there's certain things that um, I know I got because I'm used to hanging around the community a lot, but I know other people may not have been familiar with is, you know, when we talk about, you know, obtaining employment, how for um, a trans woman, um, a lot of their experiences that I heard was about, you know, having to, you know, choose between do I use my government name on my, um, the name I and I identify with or the name I've chosen for myself. Um, and so we think about, um, I think that the goal at the time was to help them get employment. So um, helping someone kind of navigate that system um, in a way that's, you know, meaningful understanding when, you know, it's probably, I would assume very disheartening to go to work and have to use a different name uh, to get hired and um, and then go home and use a different name and, you know, have, you know, disruptive that could be in someone's life, especially if they are trying to navigate, you know, just just work to pay bills. And I assume the same is for a healthcare setting if, you know, we're asking people to um, put the government name or any type of uh, name that, you know, has legal communications to it and then, um, you know, but then they have another name that they have, a, they have chosen for themselves, you know, how disruptive that could be into their um, healthcare setting, um, and so I'm not trying to um, or create opportunities for people to be them whole selves in their in their space, um, and not having people having to adjust to um, the way our paperwork is written or adjust to um, someone's just not as familiar as they can be about LGBTQ plus. Um, so that's been my thing of you know being humble and seeking information to um, not explain it for them, but for me to listen and understand and reflect back if I've heard it correctly. So I think that that uh, is something that we're going to touch on in the next few slides. And that's thank you for sharing that, William. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Jorge? So one thing that we want to drive home if there's one or two messages from tonight's talk, it's that allyship can be manifest in all sorts of ways. And then number two message from tonight's talk is there are things that we can do right now uh, in as in today and then, you know, in the immediate future and then longer term um, to be stronger allies. And it echoes what William was saying, which is, um, you know, how do we communicate with our patients? How do we learn from our patients just as we're trying to be resources for our patients? Um, and then ultimately, how do we do the same in society at large? Um, so this is uh, something that Lou and I sketched up, which is there are allyship opportunities throughout healthcare. And we've thrown some examples out here in six different environments, the personal environment between you know, how you're doing, maybe 
how you carry yourself day to day, the patient interaction environment, the interactions that we have with our colleagues, the interactions that we have uh, as professionals in our professional societies, which are a big part of, of, of healthcare, obviously, but certainly a big part, part of many fields. Um, out there in the community day to day, uh, going to the grocery store, uh, being just being part of our communities, and then of course uh, on more of the, the policy, uh, you know, quote unquote traditional side of advocacy. Um, I think that there's allyship and advocacy in all sorts of ways, but these are some ones that we we wrote down to kind of jog people's ideas. But uh, we'd be it would be great if if folks want to add to any one of these and and throw out some things that they do or think that healthcare providers can do to be allies uh, in any one of these environments. I know it's not related, but I have so much trouble not touching my beard. And like I can see my tongue, like I'm, I'm like I'm with healthcare providers, and I'm touching my face. Oh, sorry, sorry, folks. Well, you're at home. You're at home, so I think it's okay. Yeah, and I did just get on the shower, so um, that is a bonus for right now. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for me, so I put in too, the comments. Oh. Sorry, uh, who caller number two? Were you saying something? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, that might be me, Williams. Okay. So I'm calling. I'm calling okay. on my phone, but I'm listening. Yeah. So I was just okay. going to say I put on the comments about patronizing, um, you know, LGBTQ plus businesses. So some businesses are identified as you know LGBTQ plus owned, and so I think that's another way that people can um, support community um, in a way that's um, different than having to you know, go to rallies and other things like that, you know, the coffee shops, the, um, the bars, the restaurants, um, and the other businesses that um, people own, especially since we do have um, Fortune Out the neighborhood here in Houston, that, you know, is definitely a way of, um, you know, supporting the community and being an ally to the community. Definitely. Um, I think a lot about how um, I think a lot about how in my patient interactions, as we talked about already, the language that we use um, is important. But the time when I really feel that my allyship is most active is is not necessarily even with my patients, but it's with my colleagues. Um, and I think that maybe this is self-aggrandizing, but I think that there's a multiplier effect. If I'm interacting with 10 patients in a day and my, you know, my colleague is interacting with 10 patients in a day and we teach each other something, we both carry that forward. And I think that that's something that we don't necessarily do enough of is, is teaching our immediate peers about things that we're learning. Um, certainly it's something I've learned from, from being part of Doctors for Change. Yeah, I would agree with with uh, Tim. Is is um, and both of you really is you know, where do we show up? Like how how are we spending our dollars? Also, how are we showing up? Whether it's the movies, uh, the businesses, but also then sharing that out with other folks. So uh, if I watch a movie that has an LGBTQ patient or a, a, a person in there or a role in there, then I get to talk about that. And then right, it's like even watching Pose. Right, and y'all watch Pose. That's such an amazing show. And talking about everything that happens for those black and brown women as they're navigating the the scene in New York, and even with um, uh, Billy Porter's character, pray tell, and you know, and so then it just adds something to the conversation that you're in that you can bring into a conversation that I think shows so much more about when we're talking, especially like in this instance, if we're talking to our colleagues or our friends, um, because I think that it also helps negate some of the um, homophobia around us. Or if somebody's like, oh, you know, that's so gay. It's like, you know, is that really what you're trying to say? Um, because gay really means fabulous if you're looking at Billy Porter uh, or you know, however you want to <laughs> tackle that. But I think, because I think that's one of the things is like, I think as a member, and it's not, it just can't always be on the queer folk. Right, because 
um, sometimes it takes enough spoons in my day just to get up that if I'm the one who has to constantly be just saying, no, don't say transphobic stuff, don't say homophobic stuff, don't be a jerk, right? I need all of my friends around me to be able to also say that so that, uh, you know, I don't have to. And, and so how can my, my straight cis friends or my cis friends that are also, that are LGB, how can they show up for me and what more can they learn to be able to be a really good ally and advocate? And sometimes that's just like quashing some of the transphobic or homophobic stuff that, that uh, either ignorant people, biased people, or you know people that just want to be jerks out there are saying. I, I agree. I, I think sometimes, um, I know I went to one event at U of H and one of the artists shared, um, artists and writers shared that um, oftentimes they, um, sometimes stories don't get told because they, the corporate world, corporate world or media world will consider it a, a niche within a niche. And so um, th the belief would be that the audience who would be interested in that content is not there. Um, and so sometimes books are not published, movies are not made, TV shows are not uh, go past the pilot because the belief is that there there would not be anyone to kind of support it. And so I think definitely part of allyship is increasing visibility, um, increasing visibility. Sorry. Um, and so part of that is you know, you know, enjoying the content that is there and not believing that because you may not share that identity that you can't partake in, you know, observing or watching or, you know, enjoying in the entertainment. Um, um, and I, I think sometimes, um, even myself, um, being African-American, uh, Black, that people feel that certain events, you have to be Black or African-American to attend them, um, when that clearly does not always mean that it's true. Um, sometimes I will say the event that it is catered towards that community. Um, but in so many ways that, you know, a lot of times people would welcome people who don't identify uh, with the community into that space, um, especially as a way of um, in enjoying and fellowship. I think where people run into trouble is when people come in and they want to um, um, explain things or ask inappropriate questions uh, and be a place of, um, um, of like thinking I'm I would say more of the observer but then people like you know being active in that role and realizing that's not a space for you to be active but more of a space where you're a guest um, and you are being invited into the space or allowed into the space to observe and to enjoy but not a place to where you are the um taking over the narrative absolutely this, this is our yeah um i would say for those of us that are raising kids it's also that visibility and normalizing uh queer focus just other equal members of society um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious about when my five-year-old asks questions about gay couples pictured on TV and say, yeah, they love each other, they got married, and that's what families look like. You know, our family is non-conventional as well, and, and we all, we're all different and we're all special, and, and that's just the way God made us is how, how I express to a five-year-old. And I think that's really important to just be an example if you want to be an ally to, to normalize and answer questions. And if I don't know the answer, to ask someone who can help it, help out with an answer. Absolutely. I love that you're teaching. I think, you know, because kids, if they don't know anything, right, until we tell them, really. I mean, they're running off of the whole basic primer things of like, I eat, I drink, and, uh, you know, bodily functions are all I know until we tell them something. And if, 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 if we. Me. Right. Everything is you, child, and we feed it all to you, whether it's the information or whatever. And if we feed them books about families that don't look like our own families, right, that's growth for them. That shows them something. You know, not everything has to be white and hetero heterosexual. Um, I, I recently, there was a Kickstarter uh, of, a, of a short book about um, Sylvia Rivera and... Um, and I'm going to totally forget her name. I'm sorry. One of the other women who threw the first bricks at Stonewall, Miss um, Major, and I had sent it to a friend of mine. She is raising a 
um, my friend is white, her husband is uh, a Latinx guy, and so they've got a trans woman of color uh, that they're they're up bring, bringing up, and so I sent it to her, and you know, because it's like, as as much as I love my friends, that they're her parents, like they they are not this child's role models, right? They're role models in a certain way, but it's like she also needs to know her own history and where she came from. Um, but then I know that her brother and her sister, her younger brother and sister, were also look at the pictures and you know learn the story of 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 different things. And so I, I think it is so important that we, I love the way that you say it, just normalize it. Like, yeah, hey, there's families that look like this. There's families that look like that. And um, we love them. And I'm going to love you no matter who you are, five. I, this is Jorge. Um, just to add to the conversation, I think that there is something that we could all do as individuals as well, not only healthcare providers, but just as individuals, I feel like we could all do more to kind of show that we are supporting and an ally. And I really identify with that um, because I felt like even myself, I felt like I could do better really um, showing that I am an ally. For example, like um, under like in signatures, you mentioned um, adding your pronouns on there. And that's something that I haven't been doing. And something as simple as that could be something that I feel everyone could really do, adding it to either your, your bio on your social media or adding it on your signature as well. Uh, just so it's something that's very subtle, but just kind of, even though it's subtle, it's something that I feel uh, the queer community could kind of connect to, just really anyone could really connect to and really show that, okay, so um, this is someone who uh, does understand the language and doesn't understand their pronouns. It's something that is kind of like the a way of showing support and showing an ally just as an individual. I appreciate that a lot. I appreciate that a lot. Um, and I agree. It's uh, there are all these little things that we don't do. And I think that that's, I think that those little things uh, are as relevant as the big things. Um, and I certainly, the way I think about it when I try to make changes in my life is I try to pick one or two small things. Uh, and it's something I've been learning over time. Uh, but you do those two small things, those three small things, maybe try to work on some bigger things too, but uh, little changes add up. Um, I certainly feel that way because uh, change, is, change is challenging. So um, let's keep moving a, a little bit, shall we? So um, one thing that I wanted to just touch on is this question of youth. And uh, Ariana, you, uh, you hit the nail on the head very well when you were talking about uh, how can we normalize, how can we... Uh, how can we be more inclusive in just our conception of what is normal? Um, but one thing I wanted to touch on in the next slide are just some resources specific to LGBTQIA plus children um, and different resources that are out there, uh, both locally and, and uh, at more broadly. Um, some of these are things that we're familiar with. If there's anything that folks have a, questions about, please ask them. Uh, but the one that I, especially for uh, for children's health, that's that's been really uh, educational to me, uh, is the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, Queer Youth Resources. Um, and so uh, on the next slide, we'll get to it in a moment. But on the next slide, there are a couple of videos that model how healthcare providers can speak to some youth, in particular, about uh, gender identity and sexuality. Um, and that's been uh, that's been very very helpful. Um, what is pink giraffe Um That is a. I, I hope it's still open. Um, it's a drop-in center for um, youth under 18 who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so I'm not sure where they're located in Houston, by I, but as of two years ago. I think I am when I researched uh, for another talk uh, a few months ago, it was still open. So um, that is another resource for people um, in Houston specifically. Um, I think if people ever get to yeah, Austin, Texas, there is a. Okay. Um, I think no, if people are ever in Austin, Austin. Texas, um, there's an organization called Out Youth. Um, and so they, they were the first. Um, placement that I had as a social worker going through with my foundational. Um, and so they are a drop in center to, um, for youth, I want to say 12 
to 20 yeah, are you? Mm -hmm. yeah we also have um montrose grace place uh, tony's place uh, those are drop-in centers i think the some of the cool things here about like the american academy of pediatrics is the fact that it is a pediatrician pedi pediatrics group talking to other pediatricians um that are talking telling them like look this is what we as doctors and healthcare providers think and know that is is good for the youth because what we have seen happen with WPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, uh, one is that it was founded by cisgender people and it took a very, very long time before trans people were allowed to be on the board and in leadership there. But also that some people are like, yeah, but that's those trans people taking care of trans people. Of course, they're, you know, they think that versus the American Academy of Pediatrics of just saying we're providers and we know what's best for the youth and our patients. Um, also, I, I know that this one's specific to children and youth. Um, the the um, Endocrine Society also talks about hormones as well. So if anybody questions anything, we, we can we can look to other organizations. Uh, down here, when if you see kids in the house, Dr. Jo Olson, she has one of the largest clinics. I think she sees over 600 trans youth a year, maybe more. I can't remember. Uh, but but she is she is phenomenal and brilliant. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting her a few times. She comes into town every once in a while to speak. Um, and yes, Legacy at the Montrose uh, campus has uh, Dr. Feldman and there's somebody, Dr. Feldman only sees them from blockers on now. There's another provider underneath that. And then I know that also kids can go to the Texas Children's Hospital um, and see a few providers there. I would say that one of the things, I mean, first and foremost for our youth is we have to listen to them and support them. I, kids as young as you know, toddlers know who they are. Sometimes they don't have the language to say whether they're trans or cis or they're a boy or a girl. It's usually very rudimentary language when they're that young, but they also can tell us who they're attracted to. You know, they might, you know, they might want to be the princess. They might want to save the princess. Um, you see a little girl who is saying, you know, mommy, daddy, I want to save the princess. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean she wants, she's a trans boy, but it might mean that she is a masculine identified woman in some fashion, which could mean she's a lesbian or she's just a masculine cis woman. Um, but we have to listen and it, it provides spaces for them to tell us all of these different things about who they are. And this is what we're trying to provide here with this children and youth resources. And then I know at some point we do want to make a list of of Houston specific places so that when folks are looking, you know, we can point them in the right direction. Um, so, you know, that we've got a lot of things going on for our youth and then where can we find the doctors? Now, as I can tell you as a, as a queer trans man here in Houston, it's difficult to find a doctor. I've heard uh, the same thing for, from other, even cis gay men that they might have a provider at one hospital or, you know, a healthcare system and then uh, they have to go to legacy to get their prep or something else because their their older white haired doctor is like I don't prescribe things like that I don't know what to do with that so they, you know, it's a discontinuation of the incongruity of care when somebody has to go someplace else um, and that happens a lot with our youth too as well so they might have one provider and the provider is like oh I don't see those kind of kids so then they um, they have to go to see uh, one of the providers at TCH or at legacy. I, I believe there's one more in another healthcare system, but I'm not really sure where. Um, and so I know that our youth finding a, a, a doctor doctor, the medical doctor to provide blockers or hormones, depending on how old the child is, is one place that we're severely lacking, which I think is just um, utterly horrible living in the, the you know fourth largest city in the United States, literally within walking distance of the world's largest medical center. And our youth are who's lacking. I know a lot of parents who uh, in the past, they, I, I know some still are doing this, are, are going up to the Texas Children's um, at Southwest to take their child children up there because of the Genesis program. So hopefully we can make some changes in our area and, and get uh, you know some places down here because um, when you don't have care, we know that we have problems. So anyway, this is our youth page here. Tim, so, did you want to add anything to that? No, just that you know that by by all means the list is not exhaustive, and these are just a sampling. Um, uh, and I apologize for any omissions, but we will also. This is the sort of thing that, um, as providers talk, as folks 
uh, learn more about this. There, there's both clinical resources that people need as well as um, as well as community resources. And um, and so it's we something that we can certainly work on as a committee is making sure that we have good uh, good lists on the on the uh, resource guide, et cetera. Uh, for doctors to change something to do in the in the near future. Um, let's keep moving a little bit, if that's all right with folks. Um, the next slide is just as I mentioned, some of these videos, and they're they're good to have and good to take a look at. They're each one's about three or four minutes. They're they're quick, but uh, at least give give an example of some language um, at, that folks can use. But let's uh, let's skip to the next thing, if that's okay, Jorge, just for the sake of time. Um, Okay, um, the next uh, few slides I wanna talk about are, uh, or that we wanted to bring up rather, um, are three or four scenarios, and we'll just, we'll just jump through them uh, again uh, a little bit quickly, but moving forward, um, the first one here is a clinic setting. Can we go to the next slide, please, Laurie? Oh, check out the animation, what do you know? All right, oh, cool. Oh. <laughs> so the the purpose of these next three slides is to convey the message that um, at various moments in the interaction with a healthcare space, there are opportunities for allyship that are both verbal and overt outward, as well as subtle and kind of uh, more more specific that. That can all be ways in which our patients can feel more comfortable, feel uh, and feel uh, better taken care of. Um, so we've listed some examples here in the clinic setting, whether it's the front desk, whether it's the ways in which the, the staff speak with patients, whether it's the ways in which the providers interact with patients, or how the follow-up uh, is carried out. But certainly, um, from the folks on the on on the on the chat tonight. There's many, many examples in a clinical setting, and if folks want to add anything to this very abbreviated list, I, it'd be great to hear. And I just want to highlight as you think about this, um, and and Tim was helping me do this through the uh, like all the steps that somebody takes in a clinic, and then we'll see the uh, emergency room and an in hospital, like somebody who's lived at the hospital, I guess, or is inpatient, I guess is a fancy word for it. Um, and so when you think about how what happens to a patient as they walk through the door into each setting, and I, I talk to doctors about this a little bit when we do trainings, because it's like, no matter how cool you are as a doctor, if Tim's my doctor um, and William is the triage nurse, if William's horrible and Tim's great, right, that doesn't mean I have a great visit. It means I still have to go through William or through Jorge or anybody else just to see my provider. So that's where sometimes um, the, the provider as an ally and advocate is so important to the patient as, as you know, making sure because making sure that everybody along the way, that front desk, my, my, how, what do my intake forms look like, um, and that nobody assumes that I'm a straight white cisgender man, um, you know, and, and, and so each one of those interactions give place for me to be seen for who I am and for, um, all, uh, you know, for people to be showing up as allies, everybody up, not just the provider themselves. Um, similarly, in the emergency room on the next slide, um, this, is a, this is one of the first times that I interacted with a trans patient was in the emergency room um, and seeing uh, people misgender that person and and they were misgendering that person, but there was also a sincere confusion in an emergency setting about what language needed to be used. Um, the patient's medical record said one thing, the patient in front of us presented differently um, and used a, a, and obviously used their, their, their name. Uh, rather than uh, the name that was in the medical record. Um, and it was confusing. And that was confusion on top of what was a an inherently stressful time. Um, and so in the emergency room, we have this, you know, time is of the essence. 
uh, as is in other corners of, of healthcare spaces too, um, and not just with, with the medical side of things, but um, each one of the people that a patient interacts with, uh, as, as Lou said, can influence somebody's comfort level overall. And then similarly, uh, if anybody has anything to add, please, please interrupt. And then similarly, uh, in, on the inpatient side, on the next slide, we have a day-to-day -day flow in the hospital where providers and all the folks who work there communicate with one another. And whether, and that begins first thing in the morning when we take sign out from our colleagues overnight who've been covering the patients throughout the evening. And it continues through the end of the day when we, we ultimately discharge those patients or, or sign them out again. And throughout each one of those moments, um, the way we talk about patients can heavily uh, bias for better and for worse. Uh, though typically for worse, our perception of that patient and how we're going to work with them. Um, and how we're going to care for them and how we're going to, 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 to provide what they need. And so um, I can think of a patient that I had last year who was a, a young trans man um, who his medical record said one thing, his name was a different name. Um, there was confusion amongst the staff about how to talk about this. On top of it, the child had medical complexity. Um, and, uh, and it was a patient who was unfamiliar to our healthcare system overall, uh, was coming from a rural environment in Texas. And the ways in which we spoke about uh, that child behind the doors, closed doors, as we were figuring out what to do for the care plan, nobody was trying to be malicious by any stretch, but people were confused and they didn't quite know what was comfortable and they didn't quite know what to do. And in each one of these tasks, it does influence the way we carry out our work. I think the point is made. Uh, the overall takeaway is to think about our language and how we communicate throughout the inpatient environment, whether it's with the, the bedside nurses or the people that we call and describe the patient to who are in a specialty service, or uh, if we're trying to access community resources after the patient leaves. There are a lot of ways in which that patient's gender and sexuality can bias our communication about them uh, negatively if we're not really paying close attention to how we uh, how we communicate and how we advocate. Okay. All right, Lou. All right, so uh, we're gonna kind of think about next steps. Um, thank you all for being here. We've got a few more minutes left, but we wanna leave you with some things about what you can do today, tomorrow, and uh, well, in the next year as we navigate um, the situation we find ourselves in now. So Jorge, if you don't mind. So right now, as we're talking about this, first, you know, thank you for caring about this enough to spend some time with us on what our allyship looks like, what advocacy looks like. Uh, the picture that, that we have here is from the New York Times. A, there is still a clash across America over trans rights, as this says, um, even in the, in the midst of uh, the COVID uh, uh, epidemic, pandemic that's happening now. Idaho has just passed two laws. They've not been signed into law, but they've been they've been going, going through uh, the Senate there, the state, and uh, to, to basically ban the way that trans kids go to school or police the way they go to school, I guess is a better word to say, um, who can and can't participate in sports. And the other one is uh, to say that trans people can never change their birth certificates if they're born in that state, uh, which when we talk about legal documents that we both William and Tim have, have been talking about, um, when is somebody using a birth certificate? Um, how does all of this go through? Um, and so uh, aligning documents, so having a, a state ID or a passport and your social security card all line up with saying who you are with the correct name and the correct um, information on it is 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 absolutely a healthcare method. It's a healthcare issue. Uh, think about it every time you have to pull out your driver's license, and in this case, you do generally have to show an ID um, for healthcare. 
you know, proving you're the patient or uh, in a billing situation as you go out. And so how, and if you can't change your birth certificate, it can be problematic in place. So that uh, is going to be there. Um, right now, um, uh, please uh, follow Doctors for Change. Uh, if you'd like to, please join our committee. Um, you can email us. Um, Jorge, would you please put the email uh, in, in the chat for me um, for Queer Health? Um, uh, get involved. We would love to have you uh, hire people to come do trainings at your place. Um, tweet about this. There's uh, some great tweets that have been going out today, and I think we're going to have some more tomorrow um, for this today and next month, ensure that your all of your LGBTQIA plus patients, all of your queer patients um, are safe. And, and safe can simply mean that they know that you are there on your side. They don't have to come out to you. Um, think about whether you can add a pronoun pin. Think about are you introducing yourself with your pronouns? Or if something says Michael on a list and you walk in and it's person doesn't look like they identify as a Michael, you might just say, hey, what name do you prefer that I use while you're in here with me? Is it Michael? Is it Mike? Is it something else? Uh, and allow them. And also, if, if they're a minor and they say, no, 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 it's Michael, and they look very nervous, just, just go with it. Because uh, not all queer kids have uh, parents that will let them be who they are or guardians. And so we need to be mindful of that. Um, if you are a pediatrician, see if you can find a space to have space just with your patients and make sure they know that their guardian isn't going to uh, be told everything that happens. And this can be whether um, they're queer, it could be about sexual activity, it could be about a number of things. So you know that's really important that I've learned from uh, some other pediatricians that I encounter and deal with um, and talk to. Um, and so, and the continuity of care, if you are, uh, think about who you are referring your patients out to. Uh, my primary care physician, uh, I know that her list, uh, because I, I've been a patient of hers for, I think, going on 10 years now, uh, that uh, her list is a, a safe list for me, that if she tells, says, hey, you need to go see this person to go get this, you know, for a specialty, I know I'm going to be safe, uh, because even now, um, I've been out as a trans man. I do this for a living. I do this for fun about talking about queer stuff. And sometimes when I see a new doctor, I still have that momentary like, oh gosh, how's this going to go? How's this going to go? I'm, you know, I had to see a new dermatologist and I was like, I have to take my shirt off. Was she going to say anything? She ended up being really cool, but still it's that moment of, you know, uh, how it's going. Can you hear me okay, William? Can everybody hear me? Uh, yeah, we're good. I think okay. we're good. Okay. Okay. Um, and then this year, I, I, Tim and I want to really make sure that people know that the things that are happening across the United States, um, when we're talking about this class across America, um, is coming to Texas. We have seen th things like this uh, here in Houston. If you're from Houston with the Houston e Equal Rights Ordinance fight uh, back in 2014 and 2015 uh, in the bathroom ban uh, fight in 2017 uh, at the Capitol, so statewide. Uh, there is an elected official in Arlington, so outside of the Dallas area, that has promised that he will fight. Um, one of the bills that is going around right now is, if you can read what uh, this New York Times thing says, is um, criminalizing doctors who prescribe hormones for minors. Um, and, and, and it's actually, some of them are very broad um, in any way, shape, or form that if somebody is affirming or providing care to trans um, and non-binary youth. So it could be a social worker, a therapist, obviously somebody who's doing hormones or any type of blockers. Uh, and the way that they're talking about it is, uh, it, it, it's very graphic and it's very wrong of, of saying that uh, they're going to castrate young boys. And so this is the, the, the way that they are getting people riled up. And this conversation uh, will come back to Texas. It, 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 uh, D depending on um, how things go with, with the way that um, COVID hangs out uh, in our country and things like that, this could uh, come back in November or it could come back sooner. And this is when uh, trans people, especially the youth, are going to need uh, our help, especially those of doctors and providers, of signing on to letters. And uh, if you can, to call your local representatives. And for things like this, when we're talking about LGBTQ plus rights in our state, 
excuse me, excuse me, it is best to, you know, get started now, find out who is your state house representative, who is your senator, and start sending them emails uh, so that they know who you are. Start basically asking you to start building relationships with those folks and establishing yourself as somebody that they can go to as uh, a, an expert on certain things. And so, you know, if you live in Garnett Coleman's district, for example, and he knows who you are and he's doing a lot of policy work, get involved, talk to him. He uh, let him know that if you, if he needs something around healthcare, that you can help him because there, a lot of our elected officials are not healthcare people, a few are. Um, and so they don't have all of the answers. And so what can we do uh, and some of it could be uh, Doctors for Change will be writing letters. We've done some in the past. We definitely will be lobbying uh, next year and going up there as a group uh, three or four times. Uh, so we just ask that you pay attention to what happens. Um, you follow us, either join us for the, the emails, for our, get involved with our group, or at least follow us on Twitter so we can let you know what's going on. And, and also, um, when people are saying bad things about trans folks, um, stop them. Uh, whether it's your friends, whether it's your neighbors, uh, co-workers saying, oh, well, you know, this is what they're going to do. And, and, and with the cultural humility that we've been talking about is like, you don't have to know all the answers. I don't expect after an hour and a half of a conversation uh, listening to Tim and I talk for you all to be experts by, by no means. Um, and But you can say, you know, look, I, I know that's not real. I've talked to trans people. I've had trans patients um, or whatever the case may be. And look, they're just, you know, we just want to live our lives and, and you know, straight, same sort of strong Texas values as as the rest of the people here in Texas. And um, and also, I'm more than happy to have these conversations with other people and do trainings in other ways. And that's what DFC is here for, um, so that you do know as much as you can, find ways to educate yourself and to continue to learn. And um, hopefully, some of these resources. We've got a few more resources on this page and, and uh, put this up there for you all to learn more, so that you can be educated about what you're doing um, and, and what you're talking about. Dr. Singer. Okay. Well, that uh, finally we want to conclude with a, with a last slide of um, something that Lou has already uh, mentioned, but um, COVID-19 and, and the queer community. Um, HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, put out a, a report um, the other day about uh, the specific vulnerability of uh, of the queer community to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it's something for all of us to keep in mind as we work together, um, both in terms of providing care um, and, and being advocates for care, um, which is that uh, the vulnerability that is intrinsic to the queer community at this point in time uh, is going to be exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, whether it's in people's workspaces or people's day-to-day -day lives or in healthcare spaces. Um, and so the HRC report really touches on that in, in, in greater detail and, and it's eye-opening and, and important to read. So um, we'll keep that in mind um, as, as we go through the, the, the next weeks and months. Um, so with that, uh, any other questions or thoughts uh, before we conclude? I just want I want to highlight one more thing about COVID and the queer community um, and say very much thank you, Jorge, for popping all of these things into the chat for us all, uh, is that uh, when this bottom bullet point is saying that uh, protections wane, also uh, the services that become unavailable for people are some of the drop-in centers, whether it's for the homeless youth or for the queer youth that would go to Hatch, mm -hmm. which is a service um, at the Montrose Center. Uh, now, and, and even they, uh, the Montrose Center has something called SPRY for the senior people in a rainbow years uh, and where they would come together. And, and so what they're missing out on is community. And so they're already sometimes, uh, especially these vulnerable populations who might not have a family that, in the way that we all consider family, they might have a chosen family, but uh, the chosen family can also be stretched as everybody is anxious about what is going on. Um, and so if you have queer friends, um, colleagues, if you yourself are queer, make sure you just check in, say hi, ask people how they are, because they, the face-to-face -face is, is, is lacking for a lot of people, um, and especially in this community where uh, more people are living alone um, or in de much different situations where they might not be have, uh, be partnered or something.
Very true. Very true. So. Okay. So um, with again, that, thank you all for being here. Um, if you need Tim or I, you um, hopefully know how to find us. Um, Jorge's put all this stuff in there. We're both pretty active on Twitter too. So is that Dana? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, thank you all for being here. Jorge, thanks for driving. I thank Hi, you all. Diana, appreciate your time it's tonight. Dana. Who else do we got thank here? You. I think that's everybody. Thank you so much, guys. This was really helpful, really informative. Dana, thank you. Yes. All right, so we do have this recorded. So once we have everything appreciate connected, we'll be sure to publish this. Thank you all again. I appreciate your time for being part of this. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lou. And thank you all for participating. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. And thank you, DFC. Bye. Bye. Good night.